All right, everybody. Well, we are going to get started with our Blister Summit panel on ski design. Um, I am really excited about this because I have had such interesting conversations about ski design with our panelists here on an individual level. And so I think bringing you all together in this, uh, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure this is going to be a fun one. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and I will have each of you just give a brief introduction of who you are, what your role is at your company. Um, and then I think what we'll do is also have you um, just maybe offer a bit of an overview of how your particular company thinks about ski design. And if if you have a kind of guiding goal or guiding principle or primary goal, I guess is an overarching principle of ski design in general. So uh, Jed, uh, why don't you go ahead and start? So my title is Director of Product Marketing uh, for the international company for Blizzard Skis and for Technica Ski Boots, uh, which is different than, than last time we did this. Um, you know, I got probably 25 years or so in this, uh, in this game at various levels and various positions and things. Um, yeah, so, you know, basically what I do is, uh, you know, I'm involved with, you know, all of the product development things. Uh, I'm primarily focused on the strategy of what we do and why we do it. And, you know, getting insights from the markets, from our athletes, from the consumers, uh, yeah, basically gathering as much information as I can and then build the strategy and then work with our product managers, engineers, design people to actually to, to build the products. I mean, I'm part of the testing teams and things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm a, at this point in time, I'm a little bit more of a strategy guy in, into what we're, what we're doing. From a company standpoint, I mean, we're, a, we're definitely a product driven company. Uh, and in what I, you know, when, when we approach design, you know, we start at a little bit higher level and really look at the target category that we're focused on, try to figure out what the problems are in that category. What can we do to make a better skiing experience and then work with the engineers uh, to come up with new technology and innovation to actually, to, to, to make to make the category, to make the sport better. I mean, our ultimate goal from a pure product standpoint, if you want to break it down super simple, is we want to make products that do what you want, when you want. I don't care if it's a World Cup downhill ski or an intermediate, you know, on-piste ski. If you can do what you want, when you want, it's a great ski. And so we want to get there through technology and innovation. I was being asked, by the way, in the comments, we already know the answer, but I'm gonna I'm serving you up a softball, Jed. Um, I was asked, can we get a definitive answer on pronunciations? Is it Blizzard or, you know, my preferred way, Blizzard? Uh, de de depends depends on what country you're from, but it's Blizzard. I mean, all named okay. after the snowstorm, so you know everybody's okay. got their different accents and how they say it, but it's Blizzard. Mike from Folsom, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about? who you are and how you guys, I know it's, I don't, you're welcome to say like, I reject the premise of sort of an overarching design philosophy, but I guess I, I personally was curious to see if that resonated or does it didn't really resonate. So let's, what do you have for us? Right. Well, so I'm Mike with Folsom Skis. I'm the CEO and one of the founders um, and, and the, the main design engineer behind how the skis are actually built. So when I actually think about ski design, it's really directly correlated to the individual that I'm talking to, which is a much different strategy than, you know, most other large scale companies that are just coming up with a product design and having to put that product out. We, we really talk to the individuals and, and really figure out what's, you know, relevant to them and, you know, boil it down to how we want to design that product specifically for their needs, for who they are, where they're going to be skiing them, what's relevant specifically to them. So it's, it, it's certainly a much different approach. 
Um, I would say, you know, there's, there's a lot of the same fundamentals in place here. Um, when it comes to just like, you know, how are skis built? What are we trying to achieve with this ski? But at the end of the day, I really just try to bucket it into three big categories. It's geometry, overall length and shape of the ski, construction, what type of materials we're going to put in there to work better for who you are. And then lastly, camber profile, like, what do we want the ski to, you know, how do we want it touching the snow? So it's, it, it's certainly a, a, a different approach that we have. I would guess Pete has got a similar situation with, uh, you know, what we're faced with in regards to having just individual conversations and designing one singular product specifically for that person. So, you know, we, we do have some retail. Um, I do work with a, a few select retailers and we really look at like, okay, what do we want to achieve with this product? How do we want to fit in here? How do we want to differentiate? How do we want to kind of like, you know, fill the void here? And that's just such a small portion of what we do that I really ultimately spend way more time thinking about, you know, specifically, okay, who are you? Where are you skiing? What's relevant to your ski days? What exactly are you doing? That's, you know, these skis are going to be encountered and then I build it. <laughs> and I actually, you know, build the systems and, and, and build the skis physically as well. So it's quite vertically integrated at my company and uh, something that I think yields a, a pretty unique product in that regard, where I don't have to have conversations with outside engineers or really anybody else. It's, it's you know, I've got a sales staff that reports to me if I'm not dealing with that sale. And, um, you know, if I am, then it just kind of gets you know, built the way that I think is going to be fit. So uh, it's a bit of a probably different answer than I guess you were thinking it was going to be, but it's, it, it, it's how we think about it. And the niche I really wanted to fill in this industry was to be able to, you know, not have to just design a, a, a product line and, and put it out there. I wanted to be able to actually figure out what was relevant to that specific build and make it shine. So at the end of the day, if you really want to get into the weeds about exactly what I'm thinking about in every single, you know, design conversation, it can, it can range from, you know, a very surface level, just, you know, okay, you know, this is a, a somewhat simple entry level skier that, you know, hasn't been skiing for a long time to somebody that's skied every single thing on the market and knows all the metrics, knows all, you know, the material science and, you know, really, really understand it. And I, I enjoy those conversations and can really dig into them and really try to dissect what's actually important about what is working well with those skis and what hasn't been. And then, you know, ultimately build a really, really relevant product for them. So Pete Wagner, you're up. I would say our company is definitely um, in myself, you know, it's an engineer focused uh, ski company. So my background is mechanical engineering and computer science. I worked in the golf industry for about 10 years, um, mainly writing the software the other engineers would use to design the products. And I developed customization for golf equipment. And that's where I learned about manufacturing composite materials. And so I took that approach and it's a lot of it's kind of data driven and, and, uh, uh, collecting data on other products and, and developing a, a way to fit people into uh, their equipment that, that really matches them. And so fundamentally, like Mike was saying, what, what we do at Wagner Custom is we talk to the individual skier and we really focus on figuring out what their perfect product's going to be. And then we have a, a, a unique design system that, that allows us to design a unique ski for that individual based on length, width, side cut, tip and tail shapes, camber, rocker, materials, calibrate the stiffness and flex for the person. They choose the graphics. And then we have a, a pretty unique manufacturing process where we go through the same steps every time, but we can we create a unique product. So for us, it's all about matching skiers to their ideal skis. Tor, the man with the coolest name 
who's also currently drinking Whistle Pig. So he's kind of winning on a few different fronts here. Uh, Absolutely. Cheap beer like Bud Light and high-end whiskey like Whistle Pig. It's the way to go. Talk to us, Tor, a little bit about your background and your, your present role and philosophy of ski design. All right. Well, I, I've worked for the Rosnell Group, which is Rosie, Dina Star, Lang, Look, Kerma, and on. Um, I've been with that group for almost 29 years now. Came up through the race side of things, uh, was really involved with athletes setup and whatnot um, before I moved to product development. Um, been doing that for about the last 12 years. And uh, we really changed the way we developed skis a few years ago or 12, 14 years ago, where we put some practical guys uh, like myself kind of in between the marketing and the engineers. Um, the engineers are brilliant in their own right minds, um, sometimes a little far away from skiing. So trying to be able to connect the feelings that we feel on snow to make a better product in the end is kind of what we've been doing. Uh, most recently, I ran the Lang brand globally uh, for the last three years, and now I'm, I've moved back to um, be in the technical um, Alpine product director uh, globally. So really working on skis, boots, and bindings in terms of design, development, and what we put on snow. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's, uh, that's what I do now. Um, I guess the, the question was uh, kind of like, what's our primary goal or how we think about ski design? Um, for me, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, I think Jed hit it. You know, we have to look at our target market for whatever we're building. Um, uh, you know, we, we build traditionally by families, uh, which is probably a little different than, you know, the more independent guys who, who build a ski here or there, we build families. Um, so those kind of come in cycles every, you know, three or four years, depending upon where your product is, but our really our primary way to look at this thing is we look forward, we look backwards and we look sideways. Um, when we develop new product, you know, you got to look forward at innovation. Uh, I think Jed said it as well. You know, what are the problems in that, in, in that particular category or target market? How can we fix it with technology or the way we build our skis? whether it's camber, uh, geometry, or materials. Um, We look backwards, um, and it's important to look backwards to see where your successes were and where your failures were, right? We've all had failures. We've all had great successes. Um, So it's important to look at those and take the positives from your successes and learn from your failures to make better product the next time. And we look sideways. I mean, I think uh, uh, Pete may have said it. I mean, you look at a lot of data-driven stuff, and, you know, I'm sure those guys are looking at sideways to the other brands and and what's going well and what isn't and uh, we do that as well of course Uh, so um, if another brand ski gets hot we we take a look and see you know what are the feelings and it's mostly what are the feelings coming out of that it's not really about copying or doing that kind of thing it's it's to see like what is the experience that somebody's having on this ski And uh, so we combine all that and, you know, along with a really concise brief, you know, we can start to tack and move forward on the ski design and then develop from there. And it's really a kind of a create test and then repeat cycle until you get it right. I wanted to ask you guys how you would rank the innovation in ski design currently happening in the industry. And maybe we kind of you could sort of give us your top three. And so the follow-up question is going to be how your own company is thinking about this. But if if that happens to be a different answer, but from what you guys are all seeing across the industry, um, see if you can sort of rank these top three out of these possible contenders. Innovations in terms of shapes, materials, weight, durability, price to performance ratio, flex patterns, maneuverability, suspension, or other, if you think that I've left out an important category there. Um, Jed, do, out of those options, or maybe the other option, do you do a, do a kind of top three emerge out of there in terms of innovation across the industry right now? Uh, I mean... I don't know. I guess I guess I would I would begrudgingly say that weight is still uh, a, a thing that is being chased around a fair amount. So weight, materials, 
you know, is always, uh, there's always a, a new frontier in the materials that we use. So that that's definitely an innovation that, that continues to, to, um, to advance, you know, and then I, I, I would actually say my, my third, um, I think people are, are starting to focus a little more on the flex of, of skis. And I mean, there's a, there's a lot to that because weight materials, dirt, all of these things play into how a ski flexes. So, but, but I, I, you know, you know, the, the flex of a ski is critical to how it functions, obviously. And the more you can optimize it for a specific, you know, target customer or target use, the better that ski is going to work. And, you know, I think that especially given the fact that people are trying to make their skis a little lighter, it makes everything a lot more critical mm-hmm. in, in the materials that they use and how they use them, the shapes also. I mean, I don't want to, you know, shape we've, we've, everybody's been playing with the shapes a lot and, you know, I don't want to say everybody has it dialed in, but I think there's a pretty good understanding of what, you know, how to the, the camber profiles and rockers and things like that. I mean, not to say there aren't any new things out there, but I think there's pretty good understanding there. But uh, I, I do believe that bringing, bringing the things together, the flex, the side cut and the camber profile, if you can do all those things in a really optimized way, you have an unbelievable ski, whatever it is that you're building. If you can bring those three things together, you've got a winner. And okay. so, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of answered the question for our company as well. I mean, that's where we are focused. You know, the weight, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about weight more. We're, we're not focused on building lightweight skis, but we're focused on making the right weight for the product that we're building. There. You know, but, but materials, you bet. I mean, materials, we're, we're pushing hard on <clears throat> using new innovative materials and using them even current materials that we're, we have using them in a better way to optimize like the flex of the ski, for example, we've been working hard on the flex as well, which gives you maneuverability. I feel like you were just on the cusp of saying we don't build lightweight skis. We, you almost said this, but I don't think you did. We build right weight skis. Did uh, yeah, um, can I mean, we take I, credit I, I for inventing this right now? I like that. I, the idea I didn't of want rank... to, I didn't want to throw throw my marketing speak in there, but yeah. But do you I mean, guys like use that say, term? We... Yes. Right weight skis. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not, not mad at not that. Not lightweight, term. but they're the right weight. And if I'm it's a, you know, if it's a, if it's if it's a touring ski yeah. that's specifically designed to 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 you know where the priority is weight then you bet we build lightweight okay. skis, you know, but if you're building a big mountain, you know, crusher, making it light, eh, you know, yeah. that that's not, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. Feeling Tor mentioned it already in one of his comments. And, I, and I, I'm sure the other guys, I mean, it's all about how the ski feels. And oftentimes when you make it light, mm, they just don't necessarily feel right. doesn't mean you can't make it powerful and great edge grip and all those kinds of things. You can do that. Yeah. but it just doesn't quite feel right. So yeah, it is a bit of a marketing thing, but it's also, I, I believe it's also true. That was a pretty good answer, Jed. It, it was not a good answer in the sense of we were talking about quick, you know? So Mike- Sorry, sorry. <laughs> let's see if you can, let's do it this way, Mike. Um, your, I want your quick top three for the industry. You get 30 seconds on that. And then- we'll give you more time and we'll just go right into that second question of like, if, what would you say if it's different, the kind of top three at Folsom? Fair enough. So the quick answer on the general. Yep. So, I mean, just industry, uh, kind of general trends that I'm seeing are clearly weight. That has been such a talked about thing and such a considered thing that is directly correlated to materials being the second choice there. Um, you know, that's, the, the, the biggest two. And I'd say one that's missed on this, that's going to go into the other, other category is, um, sustainability. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a big thing. That's a big trend right now. And that's a really important trend. So 
those are my top three that I'm seeing the industry kind of tr trending towards. Now, if we go specifically at Folsom, and obviously I think these are things that can change over time, but where you are at right now, what would you kind of identify as the current top three priorities at Folsom? Shapes are ultimately what are going to dictate the rest of everything. So that's number one. You know, your geometry really dictates the way that ski is going to react. It's the, it's going to dictate the general personality of that ski. You know, what is this ski intended for? That is numero uno. Absolutely. And then really rolling into that shape is when you can start looking at your material and weight constraints. So it's really just A, B, and C here, shapes, material, and weight that I really look at the most. Um, you know, durability, we build a really durable product. We know that we don't have to really, you know, build that into the way we're thinking about our skis. It's, it, it's really, again, one, that shape is going to dictate what is this ski for? Is this a big mountain ripper? Is this a front side carver? Is this a, you know, whatever it may be, do everything all mountain sort of ski. And then what are the, you know, weight constraints that we're looking at is this client that we're working with somebody that's actually going to use this ski kind of 50 50 in resort 50 outside a resort or is this just a resort ski you know both of those are correlated that that material and weight conversation there so those three i think are the most important things that we're constantly focusing on over at Folsom skis and it's I, i'd say the most relevant to really yielding a ski that's going to work the best for that end user. Pete Wagner, give me your quick top three that you would identify across the industry, and then we'll turn to your top three at Wagner. Uh, I think I would say for the industry, shape, weight, and then materials. Um, and I, the, you know, the way that we, the way that we look at it, I think that, um, and this kind of piggybacks on what Jed was saying, and Tor touched on this too. I mean, I think that from our perspective, um, we really focus on on feel as being kind of the first the first thing that we try to match to a person. Because if you can get the the feel of the ski right, um, that's going to make it something that really clicks with the person. And I think feel it's it's a function of a bunch of different things. It's uh, it's the materials, it's the flex pattern, certainly. And then the shape, and uh, you know when you match up those things and it has the right feel, like that's that's when the magic happens for someone. I'm gonna interrupt myself and ask this question that came in um, from one of the summit attendees, Derek. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, we need honest answers now, okay? Do our panelists feel like the demands of the consumer have gotten, to use Derek's term, softer and less technically competent over time? So that's kind of the first question. Second question related, how, does every, how do all of you weigh mass appeal versus a, pers a specific performance bulletin, let's say? We're keeping in this order. Jed, you're up and in the hot seat. So I guess the first part of the question is, does, does it, are, are we dumbing down the skis? Are, yeah. Or are we, are we getting worse at skiing? I would say we are not getting worse at skiing. I would say that the, that the, 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 what, what we're able to do with the materials, with, with computer aided algorithms, when we design pro, all those kinds of things, we're able to really push what the skis can do. And so therefore, uh, you know, I, I think the answer is it, de it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build a ski that works for the most amount of people, then you don't, you don't go so far with the, with the performance or, or, you know, if you're trying to build a ski that is the best for a specific mm -hmm. target customer, then, then, I, then I don't think the skis are being dumbed down. But that ski, you're probably not going to sell as many of. So yeah, I mean, the the, the sales part, it comes in there. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. How does how do you all sort of weigh or factor in 
going for that mass appeal ski versus a per, a specific performance envelope. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it comes down it comes down to the brand philosophy yeah. of what you, of what you're trying to do. I mean, for us, we really try to build the 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 best performing product in the target category, which means if it's an intermediate carving ski, yeah. we're still trying to build one that performs the best for that customer, which isn't crazy edge grip and things like that. It's the ability to skid. Is it easy? Can they control it? You know, that, that best, you know, best and high performance and those things, you got to match that with the target customer. And so you know, I, I, again, I, th I think it, it just comes down to what you're really trying to do mm -hmm. in, in terms of the, the brand strategy, really. Mike. Okay. So I'm just going to use what I see, mm -hmm. you know, around my neck of the woods as my kind of baseline on this. So I live in Colorado. I live in the front range. Um, I ski winter park often. I ski, you know, a lot of these front range access ski resorts often. And what I see most of the time is people skiing on really wide, heavily rockered skis that do not support fundamental skiing, even kind of. So yeah, that's like making skiing worse. In my opinion, it's like you can get away with murder on these skis and you can be completely out of control on them, hanging on for dear life. But you've got such a big platform that you can kind of find yourself and right yourself again. That's not what I love to see. I hate seeing that. And it's all too common in the front range corridor. I'm sure anybody else who skied there can chime in and say, oh yeah, I've seen that <laughs> a lot. So, you know, yes, I'd, I'd say it, it, it is kind of a, a strange, um, you know, direction that, you know, that particular market has gone. Um, you know, when I go travel skiing, I really am paying attention as close as I can to kind of what's going on in that local market. But at the end of the day, like what I'm physically seeing on that consumer need in my specific neck of the woods is supporting less technically sound skiing. Absolutely. And it's completely product driven, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, like there's, you know, if, if, if you can't ski like a proper you know, cambered side cut ski. That's not a good thing. <laughs> you shouldn't be going that fast. And yet, I mean, and I mean, good news, bad news, right? I mean, this, it is making the sport more accessible to more people, which is something I'm not mad about, but, um, but I also see what, I agree with what you're saying. Like I see, I see both sides of it. You know, and, right, uh, right. Well, and it's it, it it is more accessible, but it's also more dangerous. At the end of the day, you're putting other people in danger, and you're putting your knees in danger. You're 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 just not fundamentally, you know, going through, you know, the the actual motions to figure out what the fundamentals of skiing are to actually do it correctly. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's I, I I totally agree with you, Jonathan. I want more people out there. I want this to be a more accessible sport in all kinds of different directions. But at the end of the day, like I also want it to be safe. And there's so many times that I'm skiing and I just see somebody ripping down and I'm like, Oh boy, hmm. Ugh, like load the shotgun. You can see him just about ready to start blowing up in that next turn. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's, it's a bit of a negative turn on that, but yeah, it's, it's something I'm seeing in my neck of the woods, which is a lot of new skiers, a lot of people that are young athletic folks that don't have the foundation that, you know, the rest of us might have. And they're standing on these big rockered platforms that just allow them to go much faster than they should be. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to go Pete and Tor. I'm going to have you guys move quick on this. Um, and we'll give you more time on some other things, but, um, quick thoughts on this question, Pete. I definitely see a trend of, um, yeah, skis being like more forgiving, generally speaking, you know, I hear that a lot. Like I let's make it fun and easy. So I would say, yeah, you know, the skis are, you know, you look at like tail stiffnesses and with designs, I think the trend is definitely that skis are, they're easier. The, the term might be playful, right? Like that's skis are not like ass kickers as much as they're playful when you, you know, and I think that People want that. They want skiing to be fun. They want to, mm -hmm. they want to keep skiing at a high level. And, and, uh, if they're older and, you know, a lot of people are good with 
easy skis. So I, I think that, yeah, with, with design technology, uh, skiing is easier and people like that. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Tor, quick thoughts. Um, well, I think, I think Mike spoke to it. I think a lot of people are mismatched with the skis that they have. Um, and, and that's, you know, probably somewhat market, uh, marketing driven, right? Industry driven, but I, I don't think we're dumbing it down. I think we're, we're witnessing technology and innovation and skiing is becoming easier and it's more accessible. And those of us that are good, that can get into the shoots and whatnot are probably pissed about that because more people are being able to get into those spots where, where, where we've normally been able to play, where those people have stayed, uh, you know, down uh, on the, the, whatever you call it, uh, Denver extreme run or whatever it is under the chair. Um, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> right. Isn't that under the chair? What do they call it? The hero, the hero run or whatnot. Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood. That's a good way to put it. But I, I mean, I think we're experiencing technology. I, I mean, quick, you know, side antidote for me, I moved out to Utah 12 years ago. I picked up backcountry snowmobiling and the hours that I put in digging myself out. And now I take people out riding on this new technology and it's unbelievable. They're, they're close to being a, a strong intermediate in four days. Uh, I'm kind of pissed. It took me all that time to get to where I was. And I think what we're seeing is technology. And some of us get stuck in this kind of concept that skis got to be hard and they got to be stiff and they got to be tough. Um, and, and, and I think Pete spoke to it. Skis are more playful than they were before. You can carve some skis and still be able to skid them. And that, you know, you weren't able to do that years ago. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the trend that I, I you know, I, I think this is positive, more people skiing, more happy people skiing, some of them probably out of control or whatnot, but, um, you know, this is good for our sport. I want to talk a little bit about manufacturing processes and, um, how much different, how much better manufacturing manufacturing processes are today than they were, say, four years ago? Would you say four years, that's not enough time, pretty much the same? Um, and again, we'll try to do this a bit quickly, but I think people would be curious. It's not about, are we getting much better end results? It's like, is the process of getting to an end result we like much better than it used to be? And maybe you guys could throw out a couple timelines for us where you feel like there was a bit of a watermark. Um, Jed, I guess we'll stay in this order for now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say, I mean, the, the processes, they basically, they've, at least for us, they've gotten a little more efficient and they've been, they, they allow us to, to basically to deliver a more, consistent quality product, which is ultimately what we're striving to do. So, uh, I mean, is there, has there big, been huge innovation, at least in our factory and the way that, that, that the process works? Not, not necessarily, but, you know, our, the, the abilities to provide, you know, a more consistent base finish, edge finishes to make sure the graphics are centered, all those kinds of things to create quality is it, I think has improved significantly delivering skis that have the same, you know, rocker camber profile there's with consistency there. That's always a challenge, you know, the, the glues and, you know, as soon as you bring sustainability in there, that, that goes into a whole nother, you know, a whole nother world as well. But I, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if, if I had to obviously speak for us, it's, it's things are more consistent in a quality yeah. way and, and, and it's more, it's more efficient. Mike. I'm going to agree with Jed pretty heavily on this one. Um, it's fundamentally quite the same, you know, four years ago, even 20 years ago, it's, it's, it's very fundamentally the same. Um, I can pinpoint a product that I developed that really made me look at very old skis and was kind of surprised at how similarly they were built all the way back into the late seventies and early eighties. Uh, I built a, a straight long ski. I just happened to, and I, I, I love it. It's a hilarious, fun ski. It's called the turn tech 201 pro. It's great. Um, but what I did is I looked at a whole bunch of really old skis, you know, literally ranging from 1978 until about 1991. And I measured them all and I looked at all the materials and I'm looking at stack heights and exactly how these things are broke down. And they're using a lot of the same materials we're all using, like straight up the exact same stuff. So it was kind of like a bit of a, an eye opener for me as an engineer being like, holy shit, this stuff's been used 
you know, for a very long time. Um, you know, in, in, in that nearer term that you're asking in this question in the four years, specifically my process, you know, I've, I, I'm continuing to improve. I'm getting more efficient. I'm getting access to better materials. You know, I've got more resources behind me, so it's changing things in that regard, specifically to my company. Um, you know, and if you really want to look at other companies specifically, it depends on how close you're keeping your ear to the ground and watching what's happening. You know, if other companies are getting in financial trouble, there's going to be big bottom line decisions that are really changing the way that they're going to manufacture their skis and it's going to ultimately affect their throughput. So, you know, I can pinpoint a couple that I've seen some ebbs and flows of good and bad, but you know, it's overwhelmingly technology has supported a better product in all you know, all, all brands out there. It's, it's you, just like Jed said, you've got higher level grinding machines. You've got more access to, to, you know, getting a flatter ski sooner with, you know, a better edge finish and, and things of that variety. That's gotten much, much better over the last couple of years. Um, and I love the innovation that's happening within those companies, um, you know, that's supplying that equipment to us. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, you know, fundamentally, it's been very similar for a very long time. And um, it's, it's very company dependent. I'd, I'd say, ultimately, I hate saying it, but, you know, that financial piece is a big, big element to this. Absolutely. And if you don't, you don't have the budget, what do you think is going to happen? That product's going to fatigue a bit. So, you know, in my case, I've happened to have a pretty successful company over the last four years and I gain more, you know, resources. I get better equipment. I get access to better material, you know, and, and I've been very lucky with my, my, my team and my staff. I, I don't have much turnover. So, you know, they just continue to get better at their craft. Uh, and that's just specific in my, in my category. Pete. I think fundamentally, um, uh manufacturing hasn't there ha, we haven't seen any major breakthroughs in the last four years um you know we can kind of look at what the star trek version might be you know which would be 3d printing and green you know everything's green materials and stuff but the reality is like that these changes they're incremental and i i think that that's what we see and it's not just the ski industry it's all kinds of manufacturing so i don't think that it's uh dramatically different. I probably with all of our companies, you know, we find operational efficiencies and, and better ways of doing things. But, uh, I, I don't think there's been any major game changers with our company. I think that, you know, we're seeing, uh, efficiency in terms of, uh, uh, speed at which we can build the products and, and do things like finishing and, and, uh, more access to, to materials perhaps, but, uh, yeah, there's not, we're still waiting for, uh, yeah, like 3d printing and stuff like that to change ski building. Tor, we can go quick on this one. If you're in agreement. Oh, I'm, I'm completely in agreement. I think, I mean, ski presses have been ski presses. <laughs> they haven't changed much in years, but I do think what's, what is changing is materials in that manufacturing process. And it's happening relatively quickly with a lot of respect towards the sustainability side of things, uh, you know, glues, inks, um, where you're sourcing your cores from those kind of things. So I think that that's changing relatively quickly. And I, if, if there's a change to point to, um, indifference in the last four years, I think it's a focus on that. Next topic, women's skis. Um, big topic. And I think that, um, I think I've come to just understand that, you know, there are a number of sort of reasonable positions on this, I would say, but um, I would just be curious to hear how each of you are thinking about this topic these days. And I think it is, I'll just say this, I think it's um, kind of interesting. We see categories for women's skis and then it's like unisex skis. It's not it's often not like here's the men's lineup and here's the women's. It's like the unisex and then the women's. And I think this is we're we're in an interesting time and culture and the rest. And and uh, again, so I I think I have um, come to think there's not one correct way to chop this up. 
But I would be very interested to hear how you guys are all thinking about this uh, when it comes to designing skis and selling skis, marketing skis. Jed. I mean, we, we take women's ski products super seriously, as I'm sure everybody does. I mean, we, you know, we, we have our women to women group that we with for years here. They are, they are really part of our whole process. Whenever we build a product, you know, we have a, a specific women's whole set of criteria that we go through. Um, you know, a majority of the products that we build, there is truly a women specific uh, model and or collection. So, um, yeah, I mean, women aren't men. So, you know, we, 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 cho- we choose to look at that, you know, and, and build products accordingly, you know, which, which plays into the design specifically in the side cut, you know, women's feet are smaller. They're, they're, you know, they're not as big generally speaking as men and, and all those things play into a lot of the shape of the ski. Um, obviously, you know, weights and, and the flex and all, uh, you know, the performance to the skis can also be adjusted, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 we, we take it really seriously and specifically designed for women. Mike. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just in line with what Jed just said, um, we very, very much so take this very seriously and we really think quite hard about how we'd like to approach it. Um, Considering we're a custom company, we kind of have a leg up and can actually figure out, you know, okay, hey, one, we're, you know, working with a female. Two, we have her her exact, you know, height, weight, and metrics and kind of what she's been skiing on. But at the end of the day, just like Jed said, women are not men. They have a much different geometry. You know, men are generally shoulders, hips, and knees are all pretty well in a straight line and stacking straight over each other. Um, And that is very, very you know, a, a very important piece to consider when you're coming to ski design and how you'd like that ski to, you know, initiate and start a turn and where you actually want to be standing on that ski and where you want the camber to apex, where you want the side cut to apex, all that good stuff. So we do really pay attention closely to that and consider that, you know, women generally have shoulders, wider hips, and then their knees tend to pronate due to that fact. So what we're doing is actually adjusting critical elements within our design to make up for that fact and not just kind of scoot them forward in amount, which is a pretty common kind of solution to a female ski design is just scoot them forward. You know, I, I, I hate to use this because it's something I'm sure everybody on this panel has heard before, but the term shrink and pink, you know, take a, a male mold, you know, shrink it down and put some pink on the top sheet and call it a female ski. That's not really thinking about it in a very, you know, in-depth way. So what we're doing is we're actually, you know, adjusting relevant pieces within our design to actually account for the fact that female geometry is actually much different than male geometry. And and we, again, I, I hate to say it, have a leg up in the fact that we can actually just adjust that on the fly and place that person in a more geometrically correct spot on the ski. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a, a, a quick answer to that from a marketing perspective. I don't feel like we do a great job at it because it, it is a, you know, myself and you know, more men that run the company. So, you know, we, we aren't that great at speaking to the female clientele and, and we really do build a wonderful female ski, but we don't talk about it as much as we should. <laughs> Pete. So at Wagner Custom, we we really just focus on the individual. Um, we talk, you know, we get a lot of feedback about what equipment you've been on, terrain preferences, uh, and yeah, you know, a lot of it is a lot of the feedback comes from the equipment that a person has been using and what they're going for. And those are the things as well as their physical information and goals. That's what drives the design. So gender actually doesn't, it doesn't come into play. We don't, we don't really consider that. You know, people come in different shapes and sizes. They have different preferences. We focus on that and matching the person to the appropriate design. So gender isn't something that we 
uh, factor in um, as like a you know a different variable when we design skis. Tor. Um, well, I think when when you look at women's, you got to look at there's different different levels of spectrums there. I mean, for us, it's been a solid focus for years. I mean, uh, almost ten years ago, we hired specific women product managers. So we have women product managers. We have some women on the on the actual engineers designing skis. So we've put a lot of effort into this side of things. But when I go back to kind of the the looking at the segments of it, you have, you know, really the the high end athlete level or really strong skiers, you know, they're, they're always asking for, and it's part of the reason why the skis are still called unisex as opposed to men's is because you have some of these high end female skiers, whether they were X racers growing up or whether they're truly free ride athletes, you know, wanting to ski on that stuff. So I think at the, at, at the top of the pyramid, um, our skis are very similar to the unisex with some adjustments made mostly for balance and flex to what Mike's point was of, of how, uh, um, a woman's, you know, body stacks up on the skis and how they actuate the ski, um, really boils down to kind of the flex pattern and balance, what I call balance of the ski. And then as you go down farther, I mean, you get down into the more of the intermediate and beginner levels. Um, I mean, this is where some of the real key women's benefits of, of you know, lightweight, um, it's where it's actually valid. Um, these are the complaints we hear when we do consumer um, uh, questionnaires and, and surveys um, about that style of equipment at that level. So uh, every level is treated a little differently, but it's addressed by our women's team. I probably, when it comes to design, f- currently feel a bit closer to Pete's stance of like unisex. And I think you guys have talked about, you know, like, well, why maybe there can be pros and cons to that. I mean, you've all actually just spoken to that as well. And um, so to me, I think I'm still, I'll just say curious about product designs being a bit more unisex. And then we're asking, well, who are you as a skier? How advanced, what size, shape, whatever. But in terms of the marketing, the terms of like making sure we are really um, encouraging women and, and being inclusive in that sense, like to me, those could maybe be two different things, right? And sometimes I have wondered if when we you know, when, when brands want to, um, you know, be reaching out to women as they should, sometimes I feel like it's heavy on the tech story. And what I have just been wondering about is, well, maybe there are things we could be doing to still be more inclusive and welcoming, but it maybe isn't so necessarily tethered to a tech story in that way. So, um, those are just some of the things that I think, you know, we've been thinking about a lot and and that I've been thinking about a lot. And and I appreciate you guys kind of saying where, where you all kind of fall in on that, uh, at the present. Um, but I think we're going to keep it moving for now. Um, so the next topic, um, this is about trends and I was curious to get your take, just what you're seeing at your respective companies, Dedicated touring skis versus more versatile, kind of more 50-50 base skis. What at your own company is trending in terms of the demand you're seeing? Is it, are like, wow, people are asking more and more for the very, like the more specific dedicated niche touring ski or is it actually that people are asking more like, give me that ski that's going to basically let me go do everything all the time, anywhere? Um, what are you seeing, Jed? Both, actually, <laughs> especially when you look at it from a global perspective, um, you know, and also you throw you throw COVID in there and, and close a lot of the resorts in certain parts of the world and uh, touring, you know, re- real touring is it's it's off the hook, you know, but we were also starting to see that even before COVID. So yes, it's a trend that COVID accentuated in a huge way, but it was also starting to roll more and more and more. Also though, the trend of, 
you know, alpine based skiers who are wanting in search for great snow to go outside of the resort, you know, and work a little bit more for it. Those sort of 50 50 style skis that you're talking about. Yeah, there's a huge demand for that, too. You know, and, and getting skis that allow you to access better, but still give you really good performance on the down. Specifically at Folsom, Mike, what, what are you seeing? What, are you, what is the demand? Yeah, so specifically, we are seeing a huge, huge increase in demand for touring skis. I mean, we sold three times the amount of touring skis this season compared to the last two combined you know, it's, it's, it, it's a massive, massive, massive peak. Um, so, and that was, you know, with all the uncertainty of what COVID was providing and, you know, our resorts are going to open, our lifts actually going to start spinning. You know, we, we just saw a lot of things trending in that direction. Um, and it's continued on through this. And I think it's pretty clear in, you know, all the, the, the Colorado backcountry that there's a lot of activity out there right now way more activity out there than there has been in past years. So we're directly seeing that in a, in a, in a very tangible sense. Um, go ahead. And just to be clear, it is people contacting you to say, I want a dedicated touring ski. They are not Correct. contacting you to say, I want a ski that's going to be fun in the resort, but is also going to be pretty fun if I choose to go backcountry skiing. I'm just clarifying here. And you're yes. saying, no, they are yes. coming in specifically asking for dedicated touring skis. Well, just to clarify on my end, they, they will oftentimes come in and want that 50-50 ski. And from my perspective, I, I try to dissuade them from that quite quickly. Hmm. Um, I really do feel very strongly that you need both. And you need to figure out a way to have both. I think trying to make a ski do too much is just, I mean, there's so many clear analogies of like, hey, I need you know, a sports car or, or, or I need a truck, but I want a sports car and I wind up getting a minivan, like, you know, like be honest with what you need. And if you can somehow make it happen, you know, have both. So we do get that conversation often, honestly, like almost all the time, like, well, I'd maybe want some, you know, tourability in the ski. I'd, I'd like to maybe, you know, consider that whole option. But that's when I just go back to the client and say, you know, how realistic is this? Do you have anything else that you can kind of pivot into that? Um, you know, and, and, and for those reasons, yeah, we, we do see a huge spike in that, but, uh, overall we've just internally from our company tried to kind of pull away a little bit more from that 50, 50 stuff and, and try to have separate containers, your road bike and your mountain bike. They're both very relevant. Pete would how would you talk about maybe the percentage of this like the percentage of people reaching out because they want a dedicated backcountry ski versus that more versatile kind of 50/50 ski what I, I what i saw is um a stronger demand for dedicated touring skis before we got into the meat of the season and i think it was a lot of people with all the uncertainty, they were kind of hedging against, you know, what might happen. Um, and then as we, I think once the resorts opened and stuff, we actually saw stronger demand of, you know, uh, like a, you know, a ski that'll have a Solomon shift instead of just like a pure tech binding. So, um, yeah, that was, I guess that was a trend that I saw. I'm not exactly sure what the numbers are, but it, it shifted. It, it was more dedicated uh, touring skis early season, and we're seeing more demand for, you know, like 50-50 type skis right now. And, you know, I think that that oh, kind of happens too, just based on the ebb and flow of the, you know, ski area is, are, you know, they're the seasonality of ski areas as well. So my get usually we see that you know the d kind of dedicated touring setups will increase as we get into the spring and there's uh you know a more stable snowpack and uh less resort options tour um well obviously coming from our brands i mean we need both 
right? You have, you have your uh, consumer base that's, um, you know, dedicated touring and this growth of 50, 50, I, I always relate this in the industry. There's a pendulum with everything we do. When side cup first came up, the pendulum sw- swung all the way. You had to have like an eight meter radius ski and a seven meter was even better. Rocker came, we had these huge rockers, waist widths and the pendulum always kind of swings back a little bit. Um, so I think we're going to see, you know, a lot of people getting into this sport, realizing that there's some true barriers to this thing. How do I do it? How do I do it safely? Where do I go? You almost need someone to show you how to do this. Um, I think resorts are seeing growth in, in those, um, you know, clinics or, or guided tours. So this is all really positive. But for me, where I really see the growth is like something that gets kind of lost in when we use the word touring. And for me, it's the skier tour, right? hard to put that together, but the, the person who goes out there who wants to go up and the reason they're going up is to ski down, right? The 50, 50 thing. Does that really match that? Um, you're kind of in no man's land to some degree. Um, so I think the category that the reason people are getting more and more into this is because they want to get out there and they want to ski down. Um, and you know, the up, let's face it. I mean, for me, I'm a big dude. I'm not a touring guy, but, um, you, you know, they suffer the up to get the down and they're willing to carry a little extra weight so that they get that stronger performance ski on the way down. Uh, Cause that's the reason they're there. And I think that that part, and so it's, it's almost a segment that has never really kind of been focused because we shove them all into 50, 50 um, of this, this person who is there to ski down. That customer is exactly the one I was talking about as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. This is really what I'm here for tonight. Not going to lie. Um, side cut numbers. <laughs> Deep state fake news. We need to get clear. We need to get people clear on this, right? I understand why they're given. I'm not even mad about that. I just want to sort of try to either set the record straight or I want to be, you know, corrected here. Um so I don't know, Jed, and then we'll move this around the panel. Side cut numbers, how fake or how legit are they? How much attention should people give stated side cut numbers? Side cut numbers are legit. Is there, is there you know, through the whole pressing process, is there, is there any tolerance? Sure, but... I, I mean, again, I can't speak for other companies. We definitely are, are not out there trying to say things that are not there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, l- legit. Okay, Jed's going with legit. Mike? <laughs> I, uh, mine are legit. Mine are very legit. Mine are oh, exactly. Oh, yours, yours are legit. Everybody else's are fake. Uh-huh. Mine are exactly as they appear on my CNC machine. And through finish, there is a light tolerance loss. I think the more important metric to focus on that I think is cheated often is actually the radius based off of how they're calculating that radius. And that is a very unique way that I think a lot of different companies arrive at that number. And there's just a lot of times, I mean, myself being the engineer and the design that designers that actually, you know, does these algorithms and put these things together and actually yields that side cut number, that, that radius, I'll see some other things and it just doesn't make sense in a lot of different companies. And it's, you know, uh, I I do see a lot of consistencies from company to company, but I do see a fair amount of inconsistencies across the board. So I do think that there's a marketing piece that comes into play. And it's like, well, this one needed to be here. So this is what this one's going to be stated. Uh, in my particular case, it's exactly as it said on, you know, my website, it's, it's, it's how it comes off on my CNC machine. (laughs) So, and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's that I'm not trying to call anybody out and say, you know, Hey, you're lying about this. Like there's a very, very good chance that people are using different equations to yield that radius. Yeah. And to be clear, I guess if I needed to specify radius is what I was talking about, like specifically interested in when like, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Jed. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, if we just mean side cuts, like we can go put a, you know, we can go measure the width of a ski in the shovel of a ski, you know, so that's super simple. But when we start getting into stated side cut radii, that yeah, was, yeah, yeah I, sorry. That's where it gets a little muddy. Uh, I would agree with that. Okay. Jed has, just for the record, Jed has gone from legit to pretty, <laughs> pretty, de- pretty sketchy. Yeah, he's nodding. That's what we got our answer. Pete. Oh, uh, are you uh, are you looking for me to continue? No, I no. I, I mean, I, when I look when I look around the market, I I would also agree that that there that the radius, if there is something out there that is, you know, not right on, uh, radius can su- is sometimes it. Pete, you know, I I definitely when I talk to people and sometimes they'll want to talk about side cut radius and they'll maybe we'll. Uh, offer a ski design recommendation and they will have a discussion about a comparable ski and they'll say, how come the side cut radius of this is so different from yours, you know, when the specs are the same? You know, sometimes the uh, lengths of the tips and tails and, and things like that can affect things, but I, I don't really, I don't, I don't really know if there's, uh, you know, if that stuff is misrecorded, you know, but what I will say is I think that someone notices the width under their foot and maybe the the ratio between the tip width and the width under foot more than they're going to notice the difference between a 15.5 and a 17.4 side cut uh, radius. So um, I think it's actually, you know, it's an, it's an important number, but there's a lot of things that affect it. The flex of the ski and, and, um, the effective edge and rocker profile. So I don't really think it's that important of a number, really. I mean, it's a good reference point, but I think people actually feel, uh, you're going to feel a change in the waist width more than you're going to feel a change in the side cut radius in general. Tor? I, I think to Mike's point, radius, I mean, if you look at the traditional way you would measure radius and you look that formula up on whatever FIS does to uh, to regulate their skis. I think radius has gotten so much more complex. I mean, we have radiuses on top of radiuses on top of radiuses that blend into that radius. Um, it may be a little different in the fourth, you know, in front of the binding than behind the binding. So um, again, I think these are reference points. I always, you know, you know, it's probably one of my biggest pet peeves uh, is the the nitpicking of little things like that of, Oh, you know what this, you guys said this was a one Oh four waist width and I'm measuring one Oh three. I mean, one millimeter, you tell me you're going to feel the difference. You feel a difference between a 90 millimeter or a 110 for sure. Right. So very similar to how ski boots are, are, are sold by, you know, medium, uh, uh, low volume, medium volume, which relates to 98 millimeter, 100 millimeter, they all adjust a little differently. So I'm a big believer in the sum of the parts. And I think Pete spoke to this, you know, it's how your side cut, your radius and whatnot all blend together and come together as the recipe, because you can have the perfect side cut. If you want to call a perfect side cut with the numbers, if you don't nail the flex yes. and the balance of the ski, it's all useless. So okay. really, I believe it's about building the recipe of all the parts together. And, and it's why I always get, you know, a little irritated when people start nitpicking, you know, the tip width and the waist width. And in all reality, to be honest with you, I could probably not even rattle off any tip and tail widths uh, <laughs> off the top of my head. I can whip off the waist width, but really, I mean, side cut something that dragged along with us through the, through the, you know, the super shape sizes that came up um, years ago. And it stuck with us for that as a general reference point. You guys have spoken really well about this and I almost shouted out preach tour while you were just talking but i i think i was in the middle of a of a coaches review that we just published and i started kind of on this tirade because sometimes like well this is the thing i'm supposed to be writing and this needs to be said right now apparently and so yeah in in the middle of a coaches ski review i sort of went off on this and i think that we are just trying to bang this drum you know, louder and louder these days is just please don't get hung up on one particular factor. It is a terrible way to assess skis or like what you think you might be into. Um, and there are some exceptions to that. If you're got to go set a schema record and it's really just about getting to the top, 
then we might want to get real focused on like, we don't care about ski ride quality or anything else. We just want lightweight or something. But I think in general, and especially as you guys have said, well, it's like, if you have a really heavy, really powerful skier bending the hell out of a ski, that side cut radius can go out the number real fast. Whereas if you have someone who's just really not able to bend that ski and they're on a very soft or a very stiff ski, I would argue once again, like some stated side cut radius number is just going to not be very relevant. And we got to look at all of these factors and kind of take them together. So I don't know. I'm, I feel like our, you know, my work here is pretty much done. I might just cancel the rest of the summit now that we have this on tape. Cause I think feel like we're good here, but, um, you know, just in case anybody else has other things that they might be interested in about ski design, is there a trend that you happen to like best in ski design these days? Jed? As I said in the beginning, we're definitely focused on trying to really optimize the ski's flex. And we've been working hard on bringing some new technologies there and, and, and being able, not just to the model level, but to the size of the model level, because we know somebody who's skiing on a, even within the same model, somebody that's skiing on a 159 versus a 189, they really have some, some, some different needs. And so, you know, I guess whether, whether it's a full trend in the market or not, um, I, I think it depends on how you look at it. But I, I do think that flex and using materials to, to really optimize that flex is, is because it relates, as we've all said, that it relates to how the ski feels, which is really the most important thing. So, again, when you bring those three things together, flex is one of the critical pillars with the side cut, uh, you know, that, that, uh, and the camera profile that you need to, to nail it. So, Mike, what trend do you like best that you're seeing in ski design these days? I, I feel like this is... I don't want to say a cop-out answer, but kind of the obvious answer in sustainability of our sport is sustainability. I like that brands continue to look at that and pay attention to how they're manufacturing their product, how they can do it in a reasonable fashion, not impact our planet in a negative way. I think that's a trend that I'm seeing overwhelmingly continuing, you know, continually being brought up over and over again, whether it be a, a large scale manufacturer or a small scale manufacturer like myself, I really enjoy that trend. And it's something that's necessary for the future of the sport. It's just an absolute necessity. So I, I love that trend. Pete, can I, ch can I change my answer? <laughs> I like <that> nope. answer. <laughs> well done, Mike. Well said. <laughs> yeah. I just did know that sustainability for our industry is so critical. And, uh, we have a long, long way to go, but uh, just in terms of what's going on right now, you know, I think that's like probably the most encouraging thing that we're seeing from my perspective. Tor? Um, well, I would second everybody's comments on sustainability. It's obviously something we need to do as a society, and it's our responsibility to do that on, on the ski side and, and, and make it work and, and, and be able to innovate with it. Um, I mean, out, outside of that one, since I think you really want to talk about skiing and, and the trends actually in the, in the product itself. Um, you know, for me, I think it's, it's, it's what I call balance. It's what we strive for. And it's, it's this concept of really allowing the ski to be really round and natural around you and not force you into positions and opening up the balance point that you have on it. So you have more usable ski when you get in trouble or when you really want to drive. And I think we're seeing that in, in our brand. Um, but I'm seeing that also in some other brands that they're getting that recipe right. And, you know, Jed and I often think a lot alike and he's working on the same things that, that we are, you know, balance is probably one of our number one um, mm. thing. And, and I refer to as balance as opposed to this flex pattern concept, because flex pattern kind of means to me like soft or stiff. And that's not really it. It's about how the profile of the ski works and how it engages when you put it up on edge and when you get in the backseat or when you move forward. So it's a little different to me than what I call flex pattern. It's more what I call balance of how the ski reacts and the feeling that you get from it. Flip side of the coin, Jed, what trend do you like least in ski design these days or the, a trend that you kind of find frustrating? Wait, I mean, I, I again, I, I, I appreciate 
weight, but they're definitely weight and feeling are it, that's it's a complicated dance between those things and you know it brings us back to the you know getting to the right weight for what you're trying to do and so i mean there there's you know a lot of brands who chase the weight simply from a they can pick it up in the store and it feels light in their hand so they're going to sell it and they forget about you know, the, the, what the skis are actually going to ski, like what it's going to feel like. Um, and again, not every, not, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not saying everybody does that, but the, 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 the just pure make it lighter cause it's better. Mm -hmm. And, and again, I, I believe, you know, Tor's, uh, Tor's analogy of, of the pendulum swinging. I think we're, we're in the, we're in the swing, bringing it back more to the, to the right weight again for the specific target. But it, it is something that always kind of annoys me. Mike. Directly in that same vein that Jed just described. Um, not necessarily just the weight. It's the trying to make a ski do too much. The 50, 50 conversation honestly drives me nuts. Like you need skis for different purposes, you know, like I, I said, my analogy of, you know, you need the truck, you want the sports car, you wind up with the minivan, you know, you got to compromise. Like, you know, if, if, if it's in your wheelhouse and you can, you know, somehow afford this and, and make it happen, you need multiple skis for multiple purposes, especially if this is a really relevant thing in your life that you're doing often. Don't try to just get one product that does it all. Um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna give up too much and it's just going to be not good at anything. So at the end of the day, that's a trend that has honestly really got under my skin for a very long time of like, well, I just want this one quiver ski that does everything. Well, yeah, sure. Me too. <laughs> but it doesn't exist. We don't have like, you know, material morphing button that we can hit on the, on the ski that switches it from a you know, 80 millimeter front side carver to 120 millimeter, you know, blower Powski in, in the, in the flick of a wrist. So that's something that really does irritate me in marketing and, and, and the way that a lot of products are put out there and, and, and the way that things have kind of been trending. And I really do love that, uh, again, pendulum analogy that Tor used it's we're in that realm of it's swung a little bit deep right now and you know oh, technology maybe is there and it can achieve everything no it's not skis are fundamentally purposed it's just like bikes and cars there's different versions of them, versions of them for different purposes so hmm. Well, gentlemen, this has been great. Um, I really appreciate the perspectives and the insights here. And I think that hearing all of your different takes, uh, it's really interesting to see actually how much agreement there's been and how many kind of complementary perspectives coming from this. Uh, so interesting and kudos to all of you. Um, you know, I knew from our individual conversations, I knew that this was going to be interesting, but I think bringing you all together collectively, well, one, that's pretty rare. And two, I'm just really grateful for you guys getting together and being willing to share with us and being able to share your own experiences. So thanks so much. Likewise, Jonathan, this was a very, very good conversation. I'm glad to be able to be asked to sit down and have this with you guys and, and get to hear the perspectives of, you know, some, some other well-respected people in this industry that I uh, definitely learned some good stuff from. So this is useful. This is what moves the, uh, the industry forward. Keep it up, man. Well, thank you. And thank you all. And until the next time, well, I actually get to see some of you like right now. Yeah. Let's have a let's have a beer. Yeah, for sure. And to the rest of you, I look forward to the next time. So, you know, get back to work and uh, keep up the good work. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.